Good morning and welcome to worship on this uh, second Sunday in Lent. Foggy Sunday morning and uh, apparently there's a little fog in our system as well. Um, we started off with everything as usual and um, but hey, you know, we were due. It's gone so smoothly lately that we were due for a little hiccup in the, in the work. So we realized we did not have sound, uh, but it's up and running again. So thank you for hanging in there with us until we got everything corrected. Um, and thanks to the quick um, and fast movements of those who got us back on track. Not a lot of announcements as we go into this week. A uh, reminder that uh, Wednesday evening, uh, we have our midweek Lenten worship on our theme at the crossroads. And that becomes available at 6 p.m. on YouTube and also a direct link we always post on Facebook for your access, easy access as well. Um, following that is the book study at 7 p.m. with uh, a Zoom gathering, and um, we are enjoying that conversation on um, the book, Love is the Way. And for those who um, may have not signed up or weren't sure about what that time commitment was, was we do have a few additional books um, that we ordered in preparation that are available, and I recommend them to you um, to check out from the church uh, Borrow, read, return. Um, they're available for anybody who wants to read them in this in this season of Lent or beyond. Um, thanks to Ron Miller and Brian Barth who were here yesterday, um, working at restoring a little bit of order in the kitchen. Uh, because of them doing some of that work, we're able to receive. Um, a credit back from the construction company and we'll be able to put that towards um, for sure a new dishwasher in the kitchen and, and a few other um, improvements there while it's torn up it's a good time to um, take advantage of, of that and so we thank them for their time and their their energy their sweat equity that goes back into us being able to add some improvements to the kitchen Reminder that uh, it's time to sign up for Iwalu. The discounts are still in place um, and we are still offering, of course, camperships to um, our campers. So uh, please take a look there online or we also sent uh, the brochures home um, to everyone uh, with uh, grade school youth in, in the Lenten bags. And I hope you're making use um, of those activities for the families. And we encourage you as you do things at home with, um, with your kids and uh, as a family unit that you post pictures uh, to share on Facebook as you maybe try the recipes in the book for each week or as you um, do one of, of the other activities. So thank you for sharing your Lenten practices with, um, with the whole community. I invite you now to please take a deep breath, um, breathing in the Holy Spirit, breathing out the uh, struggles and frustrations of uh, this week, and preparing our hearts for worship. We begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity. One God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. 
Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. you. We join together in praying the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, God, by the by passion, passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may godly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. <coughs> I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will, shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. The second lesson is from the letter to the church at Rome, chapter 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, 
not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that you would become the father of many nations. According to what he was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No trust, distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over for death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of then the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Classroom of children sits down at their desk to find that their teacher has written the multiplication table for nine on the board. As they begin to read through the math problems, it doesn't take long to notice that the first one on the list is wrong. Nine times one is not seven. The children giggle and they waste no time in pointing out to the teacher her mistake. And she explains to them that she put the wrong answer there on purpose. She tells her students the real object of the lesson that she has just put before them. Instead of noticing that she got nine other problems correct, they all jumped right on to the one thing she got wrong. The teacher explained that this will happen more often than not in life. People would be ever ready to criticize the thing you did wrong, and not appreciate what you did well. Remember this and do not be discouraged. I saw that recently on Facebook this week. Someone had reposted that story. And I remember having read it before, but it came into my mind as especially fitting as I read Jesus' rebuke of Peter. 
Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, oh, poor Peter. We hear this rebuke, and we can lose sight of the fact that right before he said the wrong thing, he rightly confessed Jesus to be the Messiah. You remember that Jesus is drawing quite a crowd, a lot of attention. He and the disciples move from town to town, preaching about the kingdom of God, curing the sick. And there's a lot of murmurs, a lot of wondering and speculation on who this Jesus really is. And so Jesus poses the question to his disciples, asking them, who do people say that I am? And after hearing some of their responses, he says, who do you say? That I am. And that is where Peter answers that Jesus is the Messiah. And then it's after that that our gospel reading begins today, where we start off with Jesus teaching the disciples about how he will be rejected and suffer and die and rise again. And then comes immediately that rebuke that we can imagine echoes deep down into Peter's soul. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus rebukes Peter rather, rather harshly, it seems. And can Peter help setting his mind on human things? He is human after all. He is a human of Jewish faith who in his time and place lives under Roman oppression. And he's a human who probably since he was a small child had been raised to have hope for the coming of the Messiah. The one who will come from the Davidic line, mighty king who will release Israel from foreign rule, return God's chosen to the former glory they knew at the height of David's reign. The Messiah will be the anointed one chosen by God to free God's people. A political warrior coming to save and to restore life. And Peter has dared to hope to himself that this one whom he follows, Jesus, is finally the one, the Messiah. Could Rome's days be finally numbered? Crowds love Jesus. More and more are following him every day. It could finally really be happening. The deliverance of Israel might be on the horizon. Peter is most likely not the only one who feels this way among the twelve. He's just the one who dared to answer the question when Jesus asked him. wonder if there's a sense of relief at first for Peter. For the other disciples when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? This is Peter and the disciples' chance to put it out there, to speak that unspoken hope. You are the Messiah. Perhaps they even feel affirmed by Jesus, ordering them not to tell anyone about him, to keep this announcement as a secret. But can't you hear Peter and the rest thinking to themselves, Oh, of course. The timing isn't right. We will keep it quiet for now. This is all probably part of Jesus' strategy for the revolution. We can't start this ball rolling too soon. But that moment of relief, that moment of affirmation is short-lived. Because then Jesus starts explaining who the Messiah is. He begins teaching about how he must suffer be rejected, be killed, and rise again in three days. It just moments before he had shushed them about calling him the Messiah out loud. But this doesn't make sense at all, this crazy talk of suffering, reduction, rejection, and death that Jesus is announcing openly, not just to the disciples, but that he, he, called, he called the crowds into the conversation. Peter can't believe what he's hearing. 
Messiahs don't die before they get a chance to save their people. Messiahs don't allow the ones they've overcome, they've come to overthrow, have the upper hand. And just as he dared to speak up before, so Peter speaks up again. That he pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him for all this craziness he's talking about. But Jesus will have none of it. In fact, he turns back to the group of 12, back to the whole crowd, so they can hear his rebuke of Peter. The Messiah, by Peter's understanding, is not who Jesus is. Jesus pushes the title of Messiah, all of the human expectations that go with it, aside. The disciples are to tell no one he's the Messiah because it would only set their mind on the human things, on their definition of who they say the Messiah is and what he will do. And the crowd would end up following who they want the Messiah to be, and no one would truly follow Jesus. Jesus begins to teach quite openly about who he is. And who he is, is that one who will suffer, be rejected, be killed, and rise again. Jesus defines himself not by that name or the title, but by what he does. By how he lives, by how he dies. Jesus sets his mind on divine things. And Jesus will not play the role of Messiah that Peter believes he and all the rest of the world needs. However... Who Jesus truly is, is exactly who Peter really needs. Jesus is who we all need. Jesus teaches who he is by what he will do, and he teaches his followers who they are by what they will do. Jesus' followers deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. And the losing of their lives, that is where their lives are saved. His followers set their mind on these divine and holy things. Instead of Jesus becoming who they want him to be, they will become who God has hoped for them and intended for them to be. These human things, they're the obstacle that get in the way of the disciples following Jesus. And it's the obstacle that gets in the way of us following Jesus. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And what is our answer? We could set our minds on the divine words of our liturgy. We can find the answer right there in the midst of our worship. We encounter names and descriptions of Jesus, the Christ, our Savior and Lord, Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world, the one who has the words of eternal life, the word made flesh, the one who taught us to pray. And the words of the Apostles' Creed also provide an answer as to who we say Jesus is. Our confession of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Notice how the words of the creed are words that echo Jesus' self-definition here in the gospel as being the one who will suffer, be rejected, be killed, and rise again in three days. We, his followers, his disciples, Christians who bear his name, we have to answer the same question. We say who Jesus is by what we're willing to do. What part of ourselves will we deny? What will we lay aside in order to take up the cross? Will we lay down the biases and the pre prejudices of our privilege? Will we take up the cross and fight injustice and exclusion? Will we lay down the convenience, the few dollar savings that we might make here and there to purchase some more environmentally responsible products and instead take up the cross of caring for creation, 
so that it's available for the use of future generations? Will we lay down the lure of power, the lure of security, promised by some politicians who play on our fears who, and instead take up the cross and care for the poor and feed the hungry and welcome the stranger? Who we say that Jesus is can be answered by what we lay down and how we take up the cross. Who we say that Jesus is can be answered by how we lose our lives for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. Following Jesus isn't easy. It will, on more than one occasion, make us quite uncomfortable, just as Jesus' teaching of his death made Peter uncomfortable. We want to force Jesus into a modern-day Messiah-like mold. We try to make Jesus follow after us, justifying our brokenness with our version of who he is. I think we need sometimes to hear his rebuke, to hear his correction. We need Jesus to shake us out of our safe and comfortable lives, remind us who he is, and who exactly has called us to follow. financial successes or our careers, the perfect family lives, our busyness, our social influence, all those things that we use to define our identity, to measure our human lives. What does the loss of any of it compare to the hope we're given through the love of God in Jesus, the one who suffered, who was killed, and who rises again? Human names and titles such as Messiah, they fail to contain Jesus. And we, as followers, we struggle to explain who he is, and those seeking an explanation of who he is struggle to comprehend it. What we cannot answer in words, we can answer in action by following after Jesus. What do we need to deny, to lay aside, in order to take up our cross? What needs to die within us so that we might truly live? Well, we can't do any of this on our own. We don't want to deny ourselves. We don't want to give control of our lives over to something bigger than us. But Jesus calls to us again and again. And he continues to make no secret as to who he really is. And in doing so, and picking up his cross, he sets us free from ourselves, turning us back to him, toward the divine, the holy, that lives in all of us, planting his cross and his resurrection between us and the powers of sin and death, putting Satan behind him and behind us once and for all. So who do we say that Jesus is? By the power and promise of his love and grace, he gives us the words to confess. And we confess not the limitations of a title, but we tell the good news of his life that is given for us, that is given for the sake of the whole world. Who do we say Jesus is? We pick up our cross and we follow him. Jesus is the crucified one, the risen one, the one who saves us and the world again and again. Amen. We join together with the whole church, confessing our faith. We do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
of the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. O Lord, in your divine love and grace, you pick up your cross and you lay down your life for humanity. You call out and name anything that would get between you and your disciples. Help us to claim and confess that you are the Messiah and to follow you into all the places that might lead us. Fill us with your spirit so that we might die to the things that keep us from loving you and serving our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Lord, in your mercy. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Lord, in your mercy. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Lord, in your mercy. Hear you made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services that help families. Lord, in your mercy. Hear we await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Lord, we pray especially for all the lives who experience a gap, an emptiness, a grief, for the 500,000 plus lives lost to COVID in this past time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue, even at a distance, to worship God with our offerings. And so we thank you for that faithful. Um, commitment to regularly returning your gifts back to God and to support the ministry that we share in loving our neighbor. Together, we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.